hear me, I'll revert to the microphone, but um, I get the impression it's a tad on the echoey side, so I'll try and project my voice so you can hear me properly. Um, I think that uh, the title that's been shown for the electric brinkmanship in Baggio could equally be replaced by uh, Cold War on the chessboard, because it was a battle between the golden boy of the Soviet chess establishment, Anatoly Karpov, and an actual Soviet defector. Now, I think this match vies with the one between Spassky and Fischer in 1972 as being one of the one of the two most controversial chess matches ever held. But the main difference between the um, the 72 match and the 78 match was that in 1972, although there were some strange goings on, like a game played in a small room and chairs being x-rayed for flies and stuff like this, and Fisher refusing to play for a long time. Essentially, Fisher and Spassky respected each other. They even liked each other. In Baggio, Korchnoi loathed Karpov, and Karpov hated Korchnoi equally back. So there was no common ground between the players. They really, really hated each other. It wasn't just a symbol of Western capitalism to which Korchnoi had defected against the might, the chess might of the Soviet Union. It was deep, personal, unadulterated loathing. They hated each other. That was a big difference. So once the fischer spassky match got going, after a controversial start, it was more or less plain sailing. OK, there was the incident of the extra in the chairs and finding the flies. But it proceeded fairly smoothly. Nothing in Baggio proceeded smoothly. <coughs> there were moments when I thought, yes, it's going smoothly. But usually within five minutes there was some crisis that totally derailed the whole thing again. Now, let me uh, <coughs> tell you how I got to become Korchnoi's second. Hi, Stuart. Yeah. I've just introduced it by saying that the big difference between oh. the two great controversial matches in 72 and 78 was in 72, Fisher and Spassky more or less liked each other. But in 78, Korchnoi and Papa hated each other beyond all measure. They really loved each other. That's the big difference. That's the background. So, welcome, sir. How are you? It all started in uh, Moscow 1974 when Korchnoi was playing Karpov in the final of the candidates match, which should have determined the challenger to Bobby Fischer for the 1975 World Championship match. As we all know, Fischer didn't play. Karpov won the match against Korchnoi and became world champion by default. But anyway, I went to visit Korchnoi during the match in 1974 when Korchnoi was training quite badly. I think it was three to zero. And uh, on a rest day, he invited me and Bill Harston and uh, Yana, who was then Bill's wife, to visit him in his Dasha <coughs> outside Moscow. Dasha being a kind of country house, which was provided for both the players in the match. They both had very good facilities. And Korchnoi had played a very interesting game in game five of the match. He was white in the Queen's in the defense. Uh, it had been a slightly unusual variation uh, where Black had played a quick C5. And Korchnoi had treated the whole thing very strategically, very positionally. He put a Queen on C2. Later on, he put it back on D1 again to emphasize his control of the D5 square. And after a hard battle, where perhaps he'd been better, it was a draw. And I've realized in between that if Korchnoi had left his queen on c2 and simply attacked on the king's side, he had very good chances of scoring an easy victory. And I showed him this idea at the dasher and said, look, I think, you know, with all due respect, uh, you know, Grandmaster Korchnoi, so I wasn't even a grandmaster, I was an international master. 
I think you could have done much better in this opening. And he seemed very interested in the idea. And in fact, he won a very quick game with the idea later in the match. Very quick game. And in fact, he won two games later on. Uh, and one of them was this very fast game in the Queen's Indian, where he was white, where he adopted my plan of quick attack against Karpov's king. He in fact he obliterated Karpov in about 20 moves. So that was my first serious connection with Korchmar. And then, as we all know, he defected from the Soviet Union in 1976. And he played a match against Petrosian in the quarterfinal of the candidates qualification tournament, and he won but with some difficulty. And his main second there was the Dutch master, later to be Grand Master, Hans Ray. And um, I was invited to a tournament in Montreux in Switzerland in 1977, just after that match. And the thought occurred to me that I could do much better for Korchnoy than Hans Ray could, even though he got the same name, Ray. Is it, is it spelled R W E Ray? It's pronounced Ray, and I'm Ray too. So, uh, in spite of uh, unseating my uh, uh, co-nominal, as it were, uh, I felt that Korchnoy could have done an awful lot better. And one of the reasons I felt that Korchnoy could do better was that at that time, I thought that English grandmasters, and I now become a grandmaster, um, were particularly fertile in interesting openings of ideas. Um, for example, one of them was playing a very quick B6 as black in the opening. And traditionally, you know, classical chess theory says you have to play to equalize when you're black, when you play for a win when you're white. And we were developing ideas then whereby black started playing for a win from move one. Very unusual at the time. Very aggressive systems based on G6 and B6. And I felt that the kind of ferment of creativity that English players were developing at the time, <coughs> you know, including Tony Miles, Michael Steen, people like that, that we could help Korchnoy, that we could inject an element of unorthodoxy that would unsettle the series of Soviet grandmasters that he had to play to get to the World Championship. So, next day I went to Korchnoy and I said, um, I think we can do better. I volunteer to be your chief second in the next few matches, and I'll recommend a team that I think can help you considerably. And Korchnoy thought for a while and accepted. And his next match was against Lev Pologaevsky in the, uh, the semi finals of the Candidates tournament. And as part of the package I recommended, I put forward the name of Michael Steen, a little bit younger than me. Uh, I've been to Trinity College, Cambridge. Michael Steen went to Trinity College, Cambridge as well, just after me. In fact, I gave him my old gown when he turned up, my old undergraduate gown, so he didn't buy one. And um, I said that Michael was an ingenious opening theoretician, lots of ideas, and I thought we should hire him <coughs> as well. And Korchmoy agreed. Uh, Korchmoy then took the extraordinary decision of also inviting uh, Yasha Murray to join the team, who frankly was bonkers, but <laughs> occasionally came up with brilliant ideas. So you had to listen to acres and acres and acres of completely insane drivel, but occasionally at the end of it a diamond popped out, uh, which was worth it. And Yasha was a nice guy, but he wasted a hell of a lot of time, but occasionally he hit the nail on the head. And uh, I'll come to that later on when I talk about the match itself. So the first hurdle uh, was the Soviet Grandmaster Lev Pologaevsky, uh, Orthodox Soviet theoretician, Grandmaster, very strong player. Um, in my opinion, a slightly rigid thinker. And we hit poor old Pologaevsky with all sorts of stuff, including playing a quick B6 against his D4 in game six. And he was completely baffled by this. He had no idea what to do and essentially got a lost position very fast. And Korchmai won that match with tremendous ease, partly because we were injecting an element of new thinking into the openings that was completely alien to the Soviet orthodoxy of the time. It was also during that match that I first encountered 
um, Victor's companion, female companion. She's not in the audience, is she? No. <laughs> Petra Lerwick. And Petra was an interesting person. She knew absolutely nothing about chess, but she'd attached herself to Victor quite soon after he defected and persuaded him to move from Holland, where he defected, a well-known chess playing country, to Switzerland, a less well-known chess playing country. Any Swiss here? No, I expect. Well, it's someone from Switzerland? No. Anyone from Holland here? Yeah, see, Holland, great chess playing nation. Switzerland, not known for its chess. But she lived in Switzerland, and he moved to Switzerland. Um, Petra was an interesting character. Um, she was very proud of the fact that after the Second World War, according to her, that she'd been a terrorist who tried to blow up a Russian train at Linz in Austria. And I presume she failed because she was arrested and sent to the Volkuta concentration camp for a considerable period. And when she emerged, she emerged with an absolute loathing and hatred of the Soviet regime. Not surprising, but on the other hand, um, I wouldn't go around trying to blow up Russian trains. But anyway, she was very proud of this but even though she hadn't blown up the train. And she had become Korchnoi's main confidant. But she didn't do much in the, in the Polo Yevsky match. She, she was there, she supported, made the tea and so on and so forth. <coughs> we then moved on to the next challenge, rather more serious, uh, playing Boris Spassky. And this match took place in Belgrade towards the end of 1977 and the start of 1978. And some of you may remember at the time uh, Corkshaw and I were involved in a big car crash on the way to Belgrade. Can anyone remember that picture in the DCM? Mm. Upside down Mercedes, front, yes. front completely smashed. And I was in this Mercedes with Victor, um, asleep at the back. And I thought, oh, hang on, why am I rolling around in the air? Mm -hmm. And when the car stopped moving, I discovered that we were upside down in the middle of the autobahn. <coughs> so being British, I looked out of the window the wrong way uh, for the traffic, because we were coming from a different direction. Fortunately, there was no traffic, so I got out, uh, couldn't find my glasses, and thought, this car could blow up. Should I go back and save Victor? And I thought, yes, on the whole, I should. So I went back, thinking the car might blow up at any moment. It was upside down, no windows, middle of the autobahn, and dragged Victor out of the car. And I said to Victor, should we go back and save the driver? And he said, no. <laughs> and I said, you're right. <laughs> so we didn't. Uh, but fortunately, the thing we smashed into was the back of an army lorry. And about a hundred soldiers rushed out and uh, looked after the driver. And they also found my spectacles, which had been um, slightly damaged in the accident. And the only damage I suffered was a slight, um, slight sprain of uh, a toe on one foot. Very fortunate. But the victor was slightly more damaged, and we had to stone the start of the match. But uh, anyway, so we got to Belgrade in the end, and um, Petra was there making the tea and generally supporting. And uh, again, initially, the impact of the new ideas on Spassky was absolutely devastating. Was that me or was that someone in the audience? Right. Yeah. Oh, it's the microphone. Right. And Corchoy moved into an enormous lead very quickly. And it looked like the match was over. And at this point, Spassky started to do something very strange. Instead of sitting at the board to make his moves, he would, when it was his move, retire to a little box at the back of the stage, a little rest box, which the organizers had thoughtfully provided. Think about his move there, watching the demonstration board. Now, I'm sure Spassky did this because he wanted to avoid Korchnoi's fierce concentration at the board. The victor, and this is symptomatic of things that happened later on, took it otherwise. He thought that Spassky was moving off the stage to avoid death rays <coughs> being emanated from the audience. Uh, created by some atomic device 
beam death rays at the stage. Now, you might think that organising an atomic death ray at short notice in a chess match in a public theatre was a difficult thing to do. But Korchman was convinced that this was the case, that Petra was adamant that he was right. So Korchman started to do the same thing. And he tried to go to his little box at the back to consider his moves. So something that Spassky had done for his own peace of mind was still <coughs> interpreted as a measure against him. And this is a common theme in what happens afterwards. Um, the strain of suspicion, paranoia, uh, thinking that things are directed against him when in fact they're not. So Victor retreated to the little box as well. And we went through a period of the match where we had a complete reverse of what had happened before. And Corkshire started to lose. And from being many games up, uh, we got to a situation where Corkshire was only one game up. And after much persuading about the uh, unlikelihood of there being an atomic death ray in the audience, we got him to go back to the board, sit at the board, and think properly. And then he won two more games, won the match, and qualified the cup off. So this brings us to Baguio, 1978, the World Championship match in the Philippines, um, presided over by the then president of the Philippines, President Ferdinand Marcos, and organized by the later FIDE president, Florencio Campomanes. Now, have you got that picture of the, um, the three monkeys? 